Diving is a dangerous sport. You need to be brave to jump, spinning and making figures in the air as you fall from a platform 10 meters up the water. It's not easy at all. Jose Antonio Guerra is a brave man. He is, without any doubt, the best diver in the history of Cuba. He's been up the podium in Pan American Games, Central American Games and other relevant competitions, but the most important moment of his career was the silver medal in the 2005 Diving World Cup. Nowadays, Guerra works as the coach of the Cuban diving national team in the Baragua Pool Complex in the capital, training the boys and girls who represents the future of this spectacular sport in the island. Surrounded by the pools that saw him become a legend of the diving in Cuba, we meet Jose Antonio Guerra, our guest today in From Havana. Thank you so much for accepting this interview with us. It's a pleasure, but it's an honor for me too, because I know your career and you're like an idol for me too. My pleasure. I could, st I could start talking about your trainers and your coaches, but I would like to start talking about your mom and how important was your mom in your career. Okay, my mother, it's practically the foundation of everything I, I've done. Uh, every medal, every title, every trophy, my sport degree, man, my whole career, career is based on the gigantic amount of support that came from my mom so she's everything for me she, she was able to watch you uh, compete abroad mm, not really I mean actually uh, she, she only watched I don't know Panam Games Olympics or whatever competition uh, as a Cuban delegation we have uh, on TV but uh, she's not a big fan of uh, watching me live you know like She's, she got too nervous, she's uh, like very emotive and I, I, prefer, I prefer it that way. Okay. Is it true that when you were a child you knew by heart the planetarium of Santiago de Cuba and you, you wanted to be uh, a pianist? Yeah, okay. My mom used to work at the Elvira Cape Library in Santiago, which was very near to the Museum Tomás Romay, which is... The, which is the, the place of the planetarium and the guide the, this guy that used to you know he has a routine so I'm talking about constellation stars and everything but like that and I, I had the chance to go there so many times twice a day sometimes that I learned that by heart and I used to interrupt him and, and you know finish uh, their sentences and all that it was very funny because one time yeah, he you know he stopped and looked at me who you want to do the job you want to do it? I was like, okay, but you know, it's the kid stuff. And uh, yes, I wanted to be a piano player, but uh, uh, it couldn't happen, man. Why? Uh, Maybe that drives us how, how do you became a diver? Do you know what? My mom, I, I, I wanted to be a piano player, but uh, there was a lot of uh, bad information about what art was back then, and uh, one of my aunt, she told me something that confused me a little bit when I went there. I just, you know, didn't pass the test on purpose. I just, you know, it was, it was like, okay, now I don't want to do it anymore. And then, just like that, my mom took me by the hand, okay, get me, got me to the sports school, sport initiation school in Santiago de Cuba. And uh, I started, like, just right away. We found, we met one of my mother's friend. She was a throwing coach, track and field coach. And uh, as soon as she saw me, she said, you know what? Take him to the end of the, the aisle. There is a door there. As for Carlos Delgado, it's a blonde guy, tall. That's it. That's it. Get, asking about uh, the diving test. Okay. She told me there, 15 seconds later, I was in the inscribed in diving. What do you remember about your first uh, international event? When, why, when it was, where it was? Okay, here in Cuba, we had an event in 93, but I was junior, the Central American uh, Junior Age Group came. But abroad, I was, that was on 96. Uh, I went to Brasilia for a tournament, and it was like, you know, this, this first time you, you see something that I, I, I knew I was there for competition, but I wanted to, to absorb everything, to watch everything, 
to learn about everything, to learn the language, to meet everyone. You know, it was like a lot of a lot of things. By the end, it was just for a week, and uh, it was over before I I couldn't even you know do something really uh, tangible. What do you remember about Montreal 2005? The, your first, I mean, the, the podium, the, the silver medal. About that day, how was that day competition? Okay. You know, diving competition are very stressful. So you're so focused on what you have to do. There's so many things we don't see. Exactly. That when, when you're that focused, you, you actually don't look around too much. It's like you're closing your thing. And, uh, and that wasn't a different day. It was just like that. I was into my competition, into my dives and all that. And uh, I couldn't see too much. But... I do remember the support of the of the Canadian crowd. I mean, I, oh yeah, man! I I remember I was beating the Chinese in before the last dive, and the whole stands stood and start clapping and you know like whistling and you know cheering for me, and that was like very uh, hard for me to get the focus because that surprised me, and uh, it was very very nice of them. I always said that uh, Canada is like my second country because I've ever, I've always had a lot of uh, support from the, the Canadian crowd. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get the gold medal. I wasn't satisfied at the end, at the end but uh, some, at some point I realized that it was like a huge thing what I achieved that day, you know. And I had to make myself enjoy it. My friends, my teammates, my coach uh, helped me a lot, of, uh, a lot about it to, to, to try to enjoy it. Lately it was easier, but that day I was still, you know, craving for that gold medal. I, it was very close. The Chinese beat me for seven points. And it wasn't any Chinese. It was the... the 2004 Olympic champion, Hu Jia, which I have a lot of, a lot of respect for him. But uh, I, I was winning. I could have, I could have done it. Do you have contact with those athletes? I mean, yeah. do you are friends among athletes? Oh yeah, diving is a very uh, peculiar dive, uh, sport. Uh, even when we are, you know, uh, how do you say that? When you're competing against it, each other. We, we don't have any contact, you know, like physical contact. And uh, whatever you do, it's by yourself. I, I win or lose by myself. I don't, I don't need you to, you don't have nothing to do with my success or my, my bad uh, performance. So everyone is uh, like very fun to be with. All the divers are very fun people smart guides and uh, we have a, like a very tight community we were in contact in touch with each other and uh, every time we have a chance to to gather we do it a lot of them come to cuba they always call me hey i'm coming man and uh, we do some here you know and uh, and yes i not not with the chinese because it's very hard they don't use facebook or anything and it's very It's very hard, but I have a couple of friends that I, I, I'm in touch with. Going I'm back changing. for a little bit again, the moment that you changed cities, that you came from Santiago, Cuba, to La Habana, you were a child, was a, a really bad moment uh, in Cuba, the 90s. How, what do you remember of those days? The first days in Havana, changing your, your whole environment? Man, it's, uh, it's hard. I was a kid, I had like 13, 12, 13 years old, and when you're that that uh, that age you you think that if there's there was there's gonna be always someone there taking care of you i came here to havana my mom stayed in santiago de cuba and uh, i had to start you know watching my clothes thinking about doing my homework by by myself uh organizing my staff my bath schedule i don't know anything everything was very hard because I had to mature, to, to mature very hard, very fast. Uh, I wasn't ready for it at the beginning, and 
add to, to that the fact that the, the country was in a very uh, bad economic, you know, economic, economical uh, situation and everyone was struggling a lot. I remember missing my mom a lot. Every time I have a problem, I, I, I couldn't even call her because we, don't, we didn't have a phone at home. And uh, it was, you know, very, very hard in the day-to-day -day basis. The, the good thing about it is that it toughens you, you know, gets you stronger, uh, gets you more independent. And it's, uh, it's a matter of, of seeing in the positive way, help you grow up faster and better. Because you, you learn from that age that, uh, that you need to take care of yourself. You can, you know, wait for anyone to do what you have to do or tell you what to do. And uh, I used to go home on vacation like in summer or Christmas, but uh, that was it. 10, 15 days home and then come back here, training, training, training. The condition of training weren't the best. The condition of the living at the school weren't the best, but we survived and my generation has the, the privilege to say that we were very strong, man. Talking about hard stuff. How is the transition from athlete to to a coach? And you're not a coach. How, how is that transition? Oh, it's hard, man. It's, uh, it's something that you need to be prepared and to. How do you deal with retirement first? Not very good. Okay, let's say something first. I had a like I had like a very very long career, like not not usual to be diving on tower 10 meters at the age of 37. So that's that's not typical. But uh, even though you get so used to the fact that you are an athlete, life is quite simple when you are an athlete. And uh, you're like in the spot, like the, in the light spot of everything. Everyone, everything was around me. Everything worked and, 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 uh, and I was like the center of my sport. I didn't realize how important was that, that was until that day that I stopped being that. That's one thing. The other thing is, you know, you missed, I missed competition a lot. I, I realized at one point that I, I was not going to be able to out for competition for a while. And, uh, and that was another, you know, hard hit. The other thing is that when you're a coach, you need to be in advance, like prepare in advance of so many things. You need to handle so many things that when you're an athlete, come on, man, everything is taking, everyone is taking care of you. That's another thing that, you know, hit me very hard. But uh, it took me a while. Also that my coach didn't want me to retire. He wanted me to, to keep going until Rio, but my, my body wasn't, wasn't in, in a good condition to do that. You said that you could be, you could have been an uh, Olympic champion, but why you said that? Because even with all the problems we have, we had here to, to train, all the, the handicap we had to achieve our goals, every year competing and all that, with, with the, the, you know, the small support we have, I mean, I'm talking uh, about money with, you know, traveling and all that compared to other countries other divers and even with all that we we you know we work we fight again like among the the big ones of this sport worldwide i was there i was very close and even with all that i was able to do that come on man i think with the the right support and knowing everything my coach knew I think 
in four Olympics. Come on, I, I was able to go to four Olympics. Sydney was for me like the easiest, but it was the first one. I wasn't ready. My coach wasn't ready for it. So the strategy should have been to go to, to take me to Atlanta 96, to get used to, to it and then, you know, face it, knowing what to come for. The other thing is that we spent 25 days waiting for a competition in Sydney. No one fighting for medals do that. They arrive to the, the you know, competition, competitive scenario just like a week before, five days before, because it, it, there is a lot of stress in, in that environment eh? and it gets you tired. That's one of the other things that probably, probably had, a, have, had a, you know, helped me to, to achieve my goal. I was third in the world ranking in 2000. I was near to the, you know, four or five top five divers in the world in 2004. And I finally made the final in 2008, but I was struggling. I was already old. I was in the favorite or anything like that, some, anything like that. In 2012, I didn't miss a dive. I did my whole list. Like, I fought, I fought, I competed for a medal, but I, that wasn't my Olympic Games. Huh? In Rio, I was too tired. My mind was uh, not ready to face all the, the pain, the work, the sacrifice of the whole year of training. And then uh, we decided that, you know, like that, I, w I didn't want to face that. Yeah? And I wasn't, I, I, I was pretty sure that I, I couldn't get a medal in 2016. So that you was know, it. Man. You know yourself. How do you deal with the fact, how, do, how does a diver deal with the fact that one jump could be his last jump? I mean, if he make a mistake, it could be hard. How do you, you know, how do you deal with the fact that an injury, is, it's, it could be the end of your career? It's, uh, it's very hard, man. It's very hard, but if your coach is aware of everything, he's prepared, he's doing everything well, the probability is there is slight. But it's true that when, when you're the diver, you're doing the thing, the dives up there, you always worry. It's like, it's always in the bottom of your mind, you know, that fear that something might go wrong. And, uh, but you need to trust the guy beside the pool telling you what to do. You need to trust yourself, your skills, your training, and uh, try to be focused all the time. Concentration is like the paramount part of diving, man. What is the measure of both sacrifice and talent in diving? If you train hard, you could get a, a top diver, or you need uh, much you talent need and yeah, man. preparation. Yeah, man. You need, first of all, you need the talent. And even with the talent and with a lot of sacrifice, a lot of work, you're not sure that you're gonna make it. Make it. So you need like more than, than talent and sacrifice. You need support, you need uh, knowledge, you need a coach who knows, who knows a lot of everything. You need a good medical team and you need luck. You also need luck. You need a lot of a lot of things, man, to to achieve, you know, a good uh, level in diving. You had all those stuff in your career. I think I I pretty I pretty much have had all of them. What do you think makes you to retire with that age you you said? Ah, uh, this is not common, as you said. Yeah, man, I think it was Lino. I mean, I, I had a good basic foundation, like a foundation of technique and all that. Lino increased that to like a very high level, but he was very careful. We, we trained for, at the beginning, a lot. 
I, I, I'm not sure if someone else did that kind of training like I did those first years with Lino. And we move, move on, move forward like very fast and like uh, a lot. Then it was a matter of maintaining that level. You know, we achieved a level of uh, skill that that helped me to be like in a good level, competitive level, without too much effort. So what Lino did was keep myself in a good shape physically, my mind clear, and just train the basic technique enough to be, you know, to have to achieve that competitive level where, wherever we want it, like to peak in the competition we want it. But he, he was very careful. Huh? He, with every injury, with every, you know, all pain or whatever, he was very careful not to push me too hard. We had a very good communication. He was always listening. He was, uh, he's a very uh, stubborn person, but he's also very smart. And uh, at one point I asked him, how much, how, how do you know so much about diving? Because he wasn't a diver, he was a soccer player. And he said, because I listen to you guys. I listen to the Atlas. Like he was, sometimes he described a dive for me in a way that only a diver could do. And you know, I was like, how do you do that? And he was so into the diving, the divers, that uh, that helps a lot not to push me too hard. Cause uh, it, was, it was like a, like a marriage, okay? One last question. If you wouldn't have been a diver, would you have been a sportman anyway? Oh yeah. I would have been uh, a volleyball player. The problem is that yeah. with this height, you know. But uh, that's a, port, a sport that I love a lot. I have a very good relation with uh, some of the greatest volleyball players in Cuba. Hi to all of them, whatever you are. And, uh, and we used to play a lot here outside the pool. We used to have like a, our volleyball court and all that. And uh, man, more than, than baseball, basketball, I don't know, soccer, I, I love volleyball. Thank you so much for this time. It's been a pleasure and an honor for me. My pleasure, man. Thank you.